Today, we're talking about a super common but frustrating condition, and that is milia. Hi, my name is Dr. Jenny Liu. I'm a board-certified dermatologist, and welcome or welcome back to my YouTube channel. We're gonna talk about what milia are, why do we get them, how to prevent them, how to treat them, and more. So if that sounds good to you, I would love it if you can give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my YouTube channel. So milia are essentially tiny keratin-filled cysts that are usually white to yellow in color, about three millimeter or less, that can occur really anywhere on our face. So essentially, they're little tiny cysts filled with dead skin cells. Now, they are basically the smaller version, at least like to, I like to think of them, a smaller version of epidermal inclusion cysts, which are the most common form of cysts that we see on the skin, something that I excise and remove on a regular basis. And if you have ever watched Dr. Sandra Lee, Dr. Pimple Popper, it is what she routinely removes and pops on her channel. Millium or milia are slightly different, but essentially kind of the miniature version of that. Now, milia, due to their smaller size, may often be mistaken for whiteheads, but they're not quite the same thing because whiteheads, in addition to just dead skin cells, also contain sebum, oil, along with bacteria, and it's one of the primary lesions of acne. The milia may be seen in acne-prone skin, but can also exist solitarily. Now, milia can occur anywhere, predominantly on the face, but can also get it on the hands, on the arms, legs, the body. And it can affect people of all ages. We see it from babies, to teens, to adults, to elderly. And there's really no gender predilection. So really, milia can affect any one of us. And there are also different types of milia. Primary milia, that's usually what we typically see on the skin one in isolation, or even ones that are like a cluster together that can occur. And there's even something called milia and plaque where you have a group of milia often kind of on a background of red inflamed skin. You can get milia as a secondary phenomenon, sometimes to obstruction of sweat glands. You can get them in neonates, we call them neonatal milia. So certainly all of these subtypes, essentially at the end of the day are the same thing, they're milia. And they all kind of have similar looks to them. It's just depending on the presentation and the onset, we give them different names. Now, why does milia occur? Well, believe it or not, we don't really know completely, but we do know there are a few factors that contribute. Number one is genetics. Some people's skin is maybe a little more sensitive in the sense they can become more easily occluded. The dead skin can trap and ball up under the skin forming milia. But more commonly really is actually what I see in clinic every day is sun damage as well as trauma to the skin and cosmetic procedures. So when I talk about sun damage, you know, chronic sun exposure leads to damage of the skin that impacts the skin, the skin's ability to repair itself. And in that process, it may create like these little tiny balls of milia. There's actually a medical terminology that we don't use anymore because it's just not very politically correct, but it's called the senile cyst and purpura. And basically the medical term is called Fave Roca Show syndrome, where individuals will present with dilated pores, low milia on sun damaged skin. The other thing when I mention is trauma. So trauma of any sort, it could be as mild as inflammation from acne, I certainly have seen that, or from actual surgery or a cut or a scrape on the skin. Basically, any time when your skin is damaged in some ways in the process of it repairing itself, you can get the dead skin trapped underneath the skin and forming these little tiny cysts or milia. And you know, for acne, I definitely have seen individuals who have really severe acne. They do tend to get more milia as well as epidermal inclusion cysts on their skin where acne occurs. And similarly, other conditions, like for example, a rare genetic condition called epidermal lysis bullosa, where there's actual abnormal skin that predispose an individual to wounds, sores, and then in the process of healing, the skin will create milia as a part of that process. And then lastly, cosmetic procedures. And here we are mostly referring to procedures that basically creates wound in the skin, trying to purposely stimulate collagen and improve skin texture and skin tone. But again, depending on the type of procedure, when you're creating wound and when your skin is healing, one of the risks is potentially milia formation. And lastly, using wrong skincare products, in particular using very occlusive skin 
skincare products. So petrolatum, really heavy, thick balms and moisturizers for certain individuals who are more prone may increase the risk of milia developing. And that is just because the occlusiveness of these products traps the dead skin. It doesn't exfoliate as readily. And so over time it can collect and form balls of keratin underneath the skin. Are there ways to prevent milia? And I would say yes. So in general, prevention starts with good skincare as it should. So starting off with cleansing. Cleansing is very important because number one, cleansing itself helps to remove dead skin buildup and help your skin to naturally exfoliate. Here, gentle cleanser that's gonna get the job done without overly irritating your skin is key. On top of that, you can look for cleansers that have exfoliating ingredients like alpha hydroxy acids, for example, that can, in the process of washing your face, do a little extra in removing some of the dead skin buildup. I mean, there's so many great AHA, BHA-based cleansers on the market. The one that comes to mind immediately is one I've actually talked about before is from Murad. I actually recently mentioned that in my exfoliation video that contains a blend of AHA and BHA and a creamy, foamy cleanser texture that is great to use once a day. Another one is from Skin Medica, a little pricier. Their AHA BHA exfoliating cleanser that contains a blend of alpha hydroxy acids, including like lactic acid, glycolic acid, as well as salicylic acid. That's fairly gentle and great to use on a daily basis. Speaking of cleansers, I definitely recommend going with chemical exfoliating cleansers, ones that are really devoid of exfoliating beads or even avoiding scrubs for that matter. The reason being is that the chemical exfoliants are gonna do their job at the cellular level to cleave those skin cells in a more gentle way, remove the dead skin buildup. What you don't want to do is go overly aggressive on a regular basis in scrubbing your skin, creating these abrasions. Because if you overdo it, theoretically, you can actually cause more damage. And that damage may actually increase the risk of developing more milia down the road. So if anything, in the process of cleansing, look for chemical exfoliants and do it in a gentle manner. Avoid any sort of abrasive scrubs or brushes um, um, to the face that's gonna basically cause more damage to your skin barrier. Tip two is add in an exfoliating ingredient that can help long-term in improving skin turnover and thereby reducing the risk of milia formation. And depending on the ingredient, it may actually help to treat milia by improving the skin turnover and getting that cyst to come out of your skin a little more readily. Here, what I typically recommend is, of course, prescription tretinoin because it actually does have data supporting its benefits and its efficacy in treating, but more so preventing milia in individuals who are more prone to getting it. Now, tretinoin is very irritating, so certainly this is something where, depending on the location, you definitely want to use with caution. It's something I actually frequently recommend to my patients, and I will prescribe to my patients who are more prone to milia, especially in the setting of acne or say after a cosmetic procedure where it actually makes sense to complement the procedure while at the same time hopefully reducing the risk of milia formation. And similarly, if you are prone to milia because of chronic sun damaged skin, that tretinoin is going to be beneficial in not only targeting fine lines, wrinkles, improving skin texture and skin tone, but it may help with reducing the risk of milia developing while treating some. Now, if you can't get your hands on tretinoin or just for some reason can't use it, then alpha hydroxy acid is a great alternative. And you can even use the two together alternating in that like skin cycling trend, right? Now here, I do recommend going with AHA over BHA. AHA is gonna be more effective at actually removing that surface dead skin buildup versus BHA have more of like a oil gland penetration. So a more ideal for acne prone skin. But since milia is not the same thing as acne, we really want to target basically the dead skin that gets built up. So going with a leave on AHA product is going to give you more benefits than a cleanser in the sense there's longer contact time with your skin. So it's going to work more effectively over time with consistent use, help to exfoliate, help to reduce dead skin buildup that may be lead that may lead to milia, but at the same time, if you do have milia, may also help to get them to surface and get rid of them more readily. And I've mentioned a bunch of leave-on exfoliating products in my previous exfoliation one-on-one video. Feel free to check that out for more um, recommendations, but one that comes to mind that's very affordable, that's very easy to use, is from the Inkey List. 
the glycolic acid 10% toner that contains 10% glycolic acid, but pretty gentle. And it's something that you can just either apply with your hands to the affected area or gently swipe with a cotton pad to where you need to use it. And also the benefit of using a leave-on glycolic acid treatment like this is it also helps to brighten your skin, may help to plump your skin, reduce the appearance of fine lines, wrinkles, dullness, uneven skin texture, and skin tone. This toner also contains witch hazel, 5% witch hazel, which acts as an astringent, so helps to temporarily reduce sebum and surface giant as well. So it's great for those, especially if you have more oily prone skin. Three, reconsider or consider using an eye cream. Here, what I'm what I'm referring to is, you know, eye cream is not necessary. Certainly something nice to have, especially if you are bothered by fine lines, wrinkles, dull, dark, dark circles. But eye cream can be a double-edged sword in the sense if you have been using an eye cream and it's a pretty thick occlusive formula and you're prone to getting milly around your eyes, that could certainly be contributing because again, of products more likely trap dead skin underneath the surface and may lead to more milia developing. Similarly, if you don't use an eye cream but have been really using rich moisturizers all over your face and extending that around your eyes, or say if you even slug a few times a week and you're extending the petrolatum to your eyes thinking that it's beneficial for your curls, which it probably is, but if you're getting milia from that, then you may want to hold off on using or applying any occlusive products to your eye area and consider adding in more of a like lightweight hydrating eye cream to help target those concerns, but at the same time, reduce the risk of milia forming. So a few eye creams that I really recommend that contains a retinol that helps to target fine lines, dark circles, is number one from Rock, the Retinol Complexion Eye Cream that contains really nicely formulated retinol. Rock is very well respected brand, really has great formulation in the retinol space, and that is a really nice one to target crows, dark circles, basically age-related changes around the eyes. And it's also very lightweight, cream lotion that it's not going to cause heaviness or occlude the skin. And the other benefit of using retinol and eye cream is for whatever it's worth, it may help to add in some exfoliating skin turnover properties. Certainly in the eye cream, when it's formulated for the sensitive area around the eye, it's gonna cause minimal irritation. So at the very least, you're helping to target your anti-aging concerns and you may get some benefit in improving the milia that's currently around your eyes if that's what you're experiencing. And on the same line, you can certainly use retinol around the eye area as well. There are a lot of great gentle formulas of retinol on the market, even in drugstores, that is really great and is, I think, personally think, suitable around the eye. Like for example, I mentioned this a few times, but CeraVe's resurfacing retinol is a great lightweight formula and has gentle retinol that I personally have used as my eye cream, as well as my retinol for my neck, which is super duper sensitive and not had an issue. The same retinol from the purple line, from the skin renewing line, I would not recommend using around the eyes just because it's a little creamier formula and if you're prone to milia, I think you may want to steer away from something. It's slightly too rich and nourishing. Other brands I really enjoyed using include like Neutrogena, whether it's their straight retinol serum versus eye cream. Both are great, pretty lightweight. I don't think it's very heavy at all. Again, Olay's Retinol 24, their retinol eye cream is also pretty lightweight. Speaking of retinol around the eyes, I mean, in theory, you could certainly use a tretinoin even over the counter a dappling around the eyes to help work out those little cysts. And I certainly have recommended to some patients, but here's the thing, you have to be absolutely very, very careful. Our eyelids are extremely delicate and thin, and most people have a hard time tolerating tretinoin as it is on other parts of their face that's not as sensitive. So yes, in theory, it can be done. And if you want to, it's certainly probably is more effective than a retinol eye cream, but you have to really proceed with caution because eyelid dermatitis, that also itself is not ideal. Over time, the inflammation can cause more wrinkling of the skin and certainly not something you wanna put on your upper eyelid. And that I say is very true for most eye creams unless 
the product suggests or mentions that it is safe to use on the upper eyelid in general products eye products should just go underneath the eye and around the eye anyways getting back to tretinoin you can certainly use that very cautiously very carefully around the eye to help work out some of that milia that exists currently i think if you are interested in doing that I suggest actually starting off with a Dapoline 0.1% gel that's over the counter because it is the most mildest form of retinoids that we know does a great job at improving skin turnover, more so than, you know, retinol. Start with that and I would say proceed with caution. Like once a week, no more than twice a week, gradually increase as tolerated. And after that, if you're having minimal improvement and you've tolerated really well then maybe see a dermatologist and consider speaking to a dermatologist on getting a, a prescription retinoid for the eye area so we talk about all these products treatments and tips but at the end of the day milia can be somewhat stubborn to remove and really the best treatment is cosmetic procedures or in-office procedures where your dermatologist may go in and just pop them out with a little blade and extraction tool or just zap them with a little cautery and it just dries them up honestly those are the most effective and easiest way to get rid of them and then you can use the other tips i mentioned earlier with a retinol or tretinoin to really prevent them from reoccurring a few last tips number one remember because milia can develop from chronic sun exposure it is essential that we protect our skin from the sun on a daily basis so this means wearing sunscreen every single day broad rim hat when you're out and about sun protective clothing reapplying your sunscreen throughout the day if you're going to be outside for extended periods of time two if you're someone who's prone to milia especially around the eyes you want to avoid super occlusive products including petrolatum you know, thicker moisturizers, balms, and even oils. All of these could potentially lead to more trapped skin and increase the risk of milia developing. And lastly, like I said, because these are super tricky to get rid of, see a dermatologist if you're just not getting anywhere. There are definitely more things we can do on our end to help you achieve your skincare goals. Let me know if you have any questions below. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.